uh, rather than having a moderator read the questions that won't be on the tape, uh, we're each reading our own question one at a time and then answering them. So my first question here is, since the existence of God cannot be proven or disproven, does that mean that atheism is itself a religion because it requires faith? Okay, so this depends on a couple things. It depends on your definition of religion. It depends on your definition of faith. Uh, it depends on your definition of God. <laughs> it depends on your definition of proven, all, all sorts of things. So the way that I define this, and this comes from uh, Craig Blomberg, who teaches here in the, uh, the uh, anthropology department, um, and uh, I don't remember his other name. There's a book uh, that, that uses the best definition that I've come across that, that describes this. They're both you know, anthropologists studying religion. And basically, it's a communicated shared belief between at least two people that posits something supernatural that is you know, faith-based, can't be shown through evidence. Uh, if one single person believes something that's supernatural, faith-based, it's not communicated or shared, it's not religion, it's just one person's belief. Um, and it has, you, you have to take someone else's word for it, lacking evidence because it's faith-based. So uh, in, this, in this case, there's nothing that atheism makes a positive claim about that requires evidence because it doesn't make a positive claim at all. It is skepticism of the existence of gods. Further, atheism is not a complete belief system. It is one question within a belief system. And in fact, there are people who are religious and atheists because all atheism does is address the question of, do you have a belief in God? Yes, I have that belief. Or I lack that belief, um, or, or whatever other answers I don't understand the question because you know I'm an infant, or I don't understand the question because I don't know what the definition of God is, or whatever. So, no, atheism is not a religion. Uh, you can be a Buddhist and an atheist. Many Buddhists are, uh, and it doesn't require faith because, as I would define faith, and we can disagree about that, uh, faith is. Uh, basically belief in something despite a lack of evidence, despite evidence to the contrary. Um, when, you, when you're not quite at that 50%, it was, you know, we talked about earlier this, this 0.5 probability threshold of I lean toward theism. Uh, if you're not quite at that 50% mark, faith can get you from you know, 30% up to 51%. Um, but I, I would say that's not justified, uh, you know, evidentially, logically, but that's what I would call faith. Um, and atheists don't use that or, or have that in, in this question. All right. I like how some of the questions are written in crayon. <laughs> it's, they seem less intimidating that way. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, let's say God exists. How do we know which one he or she is? There are thousands to choose from. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, if you become convinced... Um, that there is some kind of God. You just think, yeah, there's something out there, some kind of supernatural being of some kind. Um, how do you know which one he or she is? I, you know, you wouldn't instantly know that. Uh, I think you'd then have to do some research. You'd have to start looking into it, looking at different religions, looking at what, how they describe God, um, looking at the different conceptions of God. I mean, do some of them seem incoherent to you? Maybe it being incoherent is important to you. I mean, one way or the other, hopefully not being incoherent. Um, yeah, so I think uh, you wouldn't automatically know. Um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of a short answer to that question, I guess. Um, all right, so Daniel's up next. Okay. So the question I have here is, if there is no objective morality, on what basis do you condemn injustice? So as a social justice advocate as somebody who considers myself a civil rights activist is my profession. Uh, this is obviously something that I care about and fight for and, and work on. Um, and the, you know, the question is, if there's no objective morality, how, how do I justify this? How do I, what, on what basis do I have this belief that it's wrong? Well, I, it's not so much that I condemn injustice directly as a, you know, as a concept. What I am against is suffering. And whether we're talking about, and, and this is just going back to you know, ethics, uh, I, I can talk more in private later when we have more time, I don't want to eat up the whole Q&A, about the evolution of morality and, and what purpose I think, purpose that serves in, in uh, the spread of genes. Uh, cooperative species developed morality uh, and moral codes that they stick to not universally and not all the time uh, because genes do better that way. And it's not necessarily right or wrong. It's not necessarily true or false. It's just that some activities in cooperation tend to lead to proliferation of genes. Other activities don't. And uh, if you want more information on this, uh, The Selfish Gene uh, by Richard Dawkins is a great book. The Evolution of Morality um, is a wonderful book. Uh, there's a great book by Herbert Gintis um, called uh, Human Cooperation. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really math heavy. It gets into a lot of game theory. But the, the basic concept is that 
uh, when people don't suffer, when people work together, when people trade, and this is not just humans, but you know, schools of fish and li uh, lion prides and uh, bird flocks. When animals work together, uh, if that's the evolutionary strategy that they've developed, they can accomplish more, they can have more numbers. And that's what genes care about. That's all that nature really does is just proliferate genes, at least uh, as far as what life does. And uh, it's, the reason that I say there's no objective morality is basically because we debate these things. And it seems to me that if objective morality existed, uh, we, you know, this would not quite be so readily open for debate. Uh, right after this, we're having a debate up about the morality of abortion, right? These things have real world consequences. We don't agree on this stuff. And it seems pretty demonstrably clear to me that this is culturally dependent and not just dependent upon what culture you're talking about, but dependent upon what time frame you're looking at. I mean, 50 years ago, you know, in my parents' lifetime, when they were teenagers, we had segregated bathrooms, you know, white and colored bathrooms. And that was the norm in many parts of this country. Uh, 50 years later today, this is totally unthinkable. In 50 more years, it might be the case that we don't have segregated bathrooms for gender. And we might think it was totally unthinkable that we did just 50 years ago, you know, during our lifetimes. These things change over time. They are culturally dependent, they are malleable, and I don't think it makes any sense to argue that they are objectively true or false when we can clearly see disagreements, when we have wars over these disagreements, when we have public policy debates over these disagreements. Clearly this is in flux. Uh, uh, okay, why wouldn't a god confirm their own existence? Good question. So here's my best answer to the question like this. This is the best I've got here. So, um, by analogy, to start with an analogy, um, people sometimes talk about the Earth's distance from the sun uh, being in the Goldilocks zone, right? We're not too close, it'd be too hot. We're not too far, it'd be too cold, but it's just right, right? So we're in this zone that's just right for life, permiss you know, life permitting uh, conditions. So you can make an analogy with God and, and people and God's... Um, our awareness of God's existence. You might think um, that God could make his, his, pres his existence more well-known. He could just write it in the sky, I exist, or he could appear to everyone personally or something like this. He could make it such that there's no way you could miss it. Like you couldn't help but believe, right? So in other words, like the sun and the earth being a lot closer together. Um, now some people have a worry about that because it might violate uh, your freedom of will. It might violate your freedom to uh, reject God um, if you had no choice other than to believe in God. Now, on the other hand, God could uh, make himself even further away and more difficult to, to know. And in that case, no matter what you did, no matter how much you prayed or studied or thought about it, you could never know that God existed. You would have no reason to believe he existed, no evidence whatsoever. And that seems problematic as well, because then it's just, there's no way to know God. Um, but perhaps, right, it's just a possible explanation. Perhaps God is in sort of the epistemic Goldilocks zone, right? He's just far enough away to preserve your freedom so that if you want to ignore him, if you want to reject him, you're perfectly welcome to do so. You can do it rationally, right? You can do it, you can um, look at the evidence, and you can conclude um, in a fairly rational manner that there's just not enough evidence for God's existence. Now there's other things going on in there we could talk about, but, in, but I think God gives you the freedom and he's far enough away that you could um, avoid him. But he's not so far away that he's impossible to know, that it's impossible to have any evidence or reasons for his existence. So that's, that's one possible way to understand why God, this is the problem of divine hiddenness, right? This is a very old problem. So um, that's one way to think of it. I, uh, I kind of wish that I could have a crack at that question too. Maybe if we have, yeah, yeah, we should come back to these if we have time. All right. Uh, so my question next is: uh, Was there ever a time you claimed to be a theist? If so, what caused you to change that belief? Uh, yes, absolutely. I was a professional Christian praise and worship musician for several years, um, and uh, basically to answer the question of what changed my mind, it was learning about religion. Uh, uh, when I became a Christian, I had never read the Bible cover to cover. I, I, I knew some basics about what Christians believed, but, uh, but I, I didn't consider myself anything close to knowledgeable about it. Uh, I read 
uh, first the, uh, the NIV, which was the Bible that the church that I attended and, and worked at used. Uh, and then uh, a friend of mine told me that the King James is the more authoritative version and I should really read that, so I read that. Uh, and I decided, you know, this is kind of a silly approach. There are so many English translations and none of these are really the words of Jesus and what he really taught, what he really wanted me to do with my life or any of us to do with our lives and so on. And I said, if I really want to take this seriously as my career, uh, I owe it to myself, which is out of intellectual honesty, to really study this stuff. And I hired a classics grad student here at Mizzou to privately tutor me two or three times a week. Did that for a couple of years, studying Latin and Greek, and attempted to read the Bible in its original Koine Greek uh, and, and Vulgate. Uh, and I found out, you know, quite early in this process that it is not possible to read the original words of Jesus because they have never been preserved, uh, at least that made it to today. They've been edited and translated a lot. There are significant pieces missing in the earliest versions uh, with core sets of, of what Christians believe. For example, the resurrection of Jesus is not mentioned in the oldest and earliest copies of the Gospel of Mark, which was the first one chronologically written down. Um, so basically, just you know, short answer here, what caused me to change my mind was learning about this stuff. Uh, not just Christianity and the history of the New Testament and the Bible itself, but uh, as I got more interested in this uh, and I became an atheist and I returned to college because I, I had left to become a, a musician, uh, I started taking classes in anthropology and epistemology and um, ethics in uh, all sorts of topics that help me understand that religion is man-made. Uh, it's not really a, a, a mystery of where religion comes from. I mean, we can see it develop in real time. Uh, the Mormon religion is a great example. We have excellent written, written records, or you know, original first draft copies of all of this stuff, and it's very clear where it came from. It was man-made, and, and non-Mormons will have no objection to that assessment, I think. Um, Scientology is another great example. I think Christianity is just simply another example of this that is a bit older. Uh, the Greek religion, same thing. It's, just, it's older, but it's still man-made, and I don't think many Christians would disagree that it's man-made. Uh, to quote Stephen F. Roberts, uh, a computer scientist uh, who, who is famous for saying this, uh, when you understand why you reject all other gods, you will understand why I reject the Christian God as well. Uh, we are both atheists. It's just that I believe in one fewer God than religious people. That's really all there is to it. Uh, so I hope that answers your okay. question. Okay, Dr. Gadsden, in your argument, you talked about objective morality. Um, if some, is something morally good because God commands it, or does God only command things which are morally good, right? The youth of road dilemma. Um, someone's been in an intro to philosophy class. Um, yeah, so uh, that's a dilemma that's often posed, it's a classic dilemma for the theist who wants to preserve the idea that God is somehow connected to morality, that they're connected in some way. Um, but uh, it's been argued in the last 50 years, a number of philosophers have argued that it's a false dilemma because there's actually a third option, that it's neither the case that things are morally good merely because God commands it, which would seem arbitrary, nor is it the case that God only commands things which are morally good, which makes God unnecessary but rather God simply commands things that are part of his essence or his character, which he is necessarily. So if he commands that kindness is good, it's because that is simply an expression of his nature. So it's neither arbitrary, nor is God uh, unnecessary for morality. Okay, so the question is, even though the task is not to give reasons that God does not exist. Do you have good reasons that God does not exist? If so, will you state that? Absolutely, I do. Uh, but it depends on how you're defining God. Um, so this person wrote this with a capital G God. I, I have good reasons for thinking the God of the Bible does not exist. The God of the Bible, uh, has contradictory claims about his character. Uh, and I actually do a whole one hour lecture on this. If you want to see it, uh, go on YouTube and, uh, look for my, my talks, um, this one is called the historical reliability of the New Testament. And I go through some of these types of contradictions. But uh, basically, yeah, capital G God does not exist. It's man-made. We have excellent evidence of where this, this mythology came together, how it has shifted over time, and what qualities this God has. Uh, in the Old Testament, God was uh, developed from uh, the, the Middle Eastern uh, Babylonian religions, and actually Yahweh is... is the, the old Hebrew name for God. Uh, he was the war God, uh, but when the Israelites uh, left and established Israel, 
And I used to have you know, questions when I would read the Bible about uh, why would these people, having known God, why would they stop worshiping God and start worshiping somebody else uh, once they were aware that God exists? And actually, if you look at this from a, uh, a polytheistic view, this is very obvious why this is true. Uh, the Israelites were not always monotheistic. That's actually a relatively new thing to the to the Jewish religion. Uh, as it happens, they, when they were at war, then they worshiped their war god, and when they weren't, they worshiped their uh, agricultural god, and there's a reason for that. Uh, later, they were all kind of melded into one figure, but uh, yeah, that's, that's one good reason. And then um, later, you know, Jesus, uh, according to the New Testament, totally upended a lot of these types of teachings, uh, expressing uh, great love and acceptance uh, as opposed to, you know, outright acts of genocide and commanding people to kill people for being gay and so on. Obviously, the character has changed drastically, and I would argue that the best explanation for that is we had a different author, <laughs> not that God drastically changed his character. Um, but yeah, if we're talking about a God, which is, you know, what we're talking about today, uh, my reasons that I might have for a God not existing, again, I would say it's, it's really not something I can answer because I don't believe that has been defined uh, clearly enough to give an answer to that question. Um, it's without more information, without knowing how many golf balls are in the bag, uh, it is not possible to say that something does or doesn't exist um, with any degree of certainty, and we have to be undefined on that, uh, and that's where I stand. Uh, okay, so um, this one's a little long. How can you simultaneously accept and reject the notion of an infinite regress, that is, you accept, that the, you accept the premise that the universe must have a cause, but that gods are not required to have a cause. What empirical evidence is there for uncaused gods? Okay, there's a couple different questions there. Um, so, yes, I reject the notion of an infinite regress. I think an actual uh, infinite set of anything in the physical universe would be, um, or events or causes would be impossible. Um, but I accept the premise that the universe must have a cause, that, that gods are not required to have a cause. So I think they want to know, well, how, where do I come off saying God doesn't require a cause, that God's not required to have a cause? Something I didn't mention earlier, I, I just thought of. I mean, one of the ways people have summed up sort of this conception of God, how do we think about God or define God? God is simply the greatest conceivable being, right? That's one way to think of it. So just think of all the qualities or attributes that would make a being as great as you can possibly imagine a being to be, whatever they are. I mean, we'd probably agree on most of them, I think. Um, I think one of those properties that a greatest conceivable being would have would be eternality or um, non-contingency, right, or necessity, uh, just a being that simply isn't dependent on anything else for its existence. So that would be one reason I would say that it seems very reasonable to Believe, to, to believe in a concept of God that doesn't require him to be, have a cause. As far as what empirical evidence is there for uncaused gods, uh, none. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's like asking, uh, that's like asking are, what empirical evidence is there for numbers, right? I mean, I'm not talking about numerals, right? I'm talking about actual number, like abstract objects, concepts. What empirical evidence is there for um, a square? Right? A lot of things, these are abstract concepts that don't exist in the physical universe, so there can't be empirical evidence. It's simply the wrong kind of question to ask. Right? Danielle, can an atheist find solace in temporary significance? This is a question that every person must answer for themselves. Uh, it depends on your system of philosophy and approaching life and what significance or meaning means to you. I tend to think that the meaning of life is not only personal but can change and that uh, it's something that, that insofar as free will exists, which is another argument, uh, that you decide for yourself. So I find meaning in my life through a number of things totally separate from worshiping a god uh, or submitting to a god as, as a Muslim might word it. Um, that, that might be the purpose of life for a religious person, but for me, the purpose of life is to make the world better for other people, to lessen suffering on this earth, to leave the world better than I found it, to have a, a positive legacy. Um, and I'm totally fine with being completely forgotten at some point in the future, 
Um, I understand that that happens to even great people. <laughs> so what should, you know, what, where do I think that I should, should last forever? I, I don't think that. Um, and I think that it would be selfish for me to think that in, in light of how many other amazingly wonderful people have existed throughout time uh, that don't get enough credit. Um, as I said, you know, I find meaning in my life through uh, uh, many different things. I have a, a meaningful, f meaning-filled life. Uh, I have pets, I have family, I have friends, I collect art, I collect handmade guitars, I collect author-signed books. Uh, the experiences that I've had with people uh, whose lives have impacted me in the way that I think and, and I hope the way that I have impacted other people's lives in a positive way, I hope. Um, and the activism work that I do, as I said, to lessen suffering for other people, that is what gives my life meaning. I cannot answer the question, can an atheist find solace in temporary significance? Because that depends on the atheist. I think that if you choose to have meaning in your life and you work toward having meaning in your life, then you can have meaning in your life. And it is temporary, but I think that the fact that it's temporary is what gives it significance. I mean, if you are in the middle of the Sahara Desert and you have no water. Water's pretty damn significant at that point, right? Because it's in finite supply, because, because you need it. Uh, if you are you know, swimming in a river and you're drowning, water might seem significant, but for a very different reason. But my point is, what, something being finite is what gives it significance. If something is eternal, we don't value it at all. I mean, you know, we, we don't really care about taking a 20 minute shower instead of a 10 minute shower because water is so cheap. The people in Flint, Michigan, they care a lot about that. It's, be, it's this temporary aspect of significance is what makes it significant. And I think that that's, that's really important and something for atheists to consider uh, as far as where we fit into the world and, and in history uh, and in the lives of the people around us. Thanks. I'm gonna go for the tough question. All right. <clears throat> if God told you to kill Danielle, would you do it? <laughs> You'd like to know, wouldn't you? Uh, I'm going to have to say no. Um, and I'm sure um, there would need to be a conversation about why. And I'll, I'll just give a brief answer to why. And I know that this would be a long and ongoing conversation. This is, a, this is an interesting question. Uh, without more parameters or more details, I'd have to say this. Um, you know, when people say that God tells them to do things, God speaks to them, um, even as a Christian, we often, we often meet those kind of claims with some skepticism, right? We have to be very careful about, um, a certain, you know, affirming that God has indeed spoken to someone. Or, I mean, that's what a community is for. That's what reason is for. There's a lot of things you'd want, some tests you'd want to run that through to say, okay, is this, did God really speak to me? Is this really from God? And I think once you've run something like that through all those safeguards, um, I think you'd have to conclude that that is, in fact, not coming from God. Um, at least that would be my conclusion. I'd have to say I'm more confident, I have more confidence in God's, nature and character, and that is inconsistent with his nature and character, then I would be that I was actually not uh, having an auditory hallucination of some kind. So in that particular case, um, I'd have to say no. So you're safe. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.